The Camp Hill Schools for Children in Need of Special Care was started in Scotland in 1940 by a small group of refugees from Vienna. It's a movement that has pioneered a radically new and in many ways still unique approach to those who are mentally handicapped. Here, for example, through these colour and movement therapies, the children's attention to the world of colours is heightened and many are also helped to relax, thereby unlocking for a moment the cramping effect of handicaps like cerebral palsy. The experience they find can also ease some autistic children out of their sensory fixations and their obsession with the straight and sharp edges of mechanical objects. There are now over 80 Camp Hill communities throughout the world for the education and care not only of children but also of adults who are mentally handicapped. The daily rhythm is felt to be as important for the children as the various therapies and the education itself. Dominique, bonjour. Où est le grand sourire ce matin? T'as bien brossé les dents? Hein? Sammy, hé, hey. bonjour, comment va, ça va bien, oui, t'es venu à l'école pour travailler ce matin, oui, oui ou non, <laughs> ça ce n'est pas une réponse, over here in the bucket, put them in the bucket now, in the bucket, Why were you not in school yesterday? Where were you yesterday? <laughs> you were in? Inside. Inside, yes. And not only inside, but in your? Room. And not only in your room, but in your? In your? In your? In your pillow, yes. <laughs> in your pillow you were. Yes, you didn't feel well. Welcome back, Nicole. So, Nana Bonzo, he set off in his canoe. In Britain, the children at Camp Hill schools are largely sent and paid for by local authorities. Many have multiple handicaps, often with severe behavioral problems as well. In recent years, the trend has been to try and keep children at home, or at least in their own locality. It's only when the situation gets desperate that children are sent away to schools like Camp Hill. This makes the task of helping them very much more difficult. Here in Scotland, at the first Camp Hill school, as well as throughout the movement, the co-workers, as the staff are called, live communally and without wages. There's no going on and off duty. Their aim has always been to live with and not just for the children. Dr. Koenig, continuing the curative work he'd begun on the continent, founded Camp Hill with nine other refugees and a small group of children on the outskirts of Aberdeen during the last war. 
he'd been inspired by another Austrian, the educationalist and philosopher Rudolf Steiner. Deeply shocked by what was happening in Europe under the Nazis, Dr. Koenig had an image of Camp Hill as a candle on a hill, a symbol of the fragile yet visionary nature of the idealistic community he was founding, a light in the darkness. I first filmed at the Camp Hill School in Aberdeen 22 years ago. Every morning the children were, and still are, woken with music. I think one of our main aims is to realize that each child is not only potentially educable, but has in himself something which is as whole and sound as that something in me or in you. And we hold on to the fact that what appears to be ill or handicapped or in need of special care is not the very child himself, but his makeup. Once there lived a holy man in Bethlehem, whose name was Jerome. He lived in a monastery with other monks. One evening, Jerome sat reading to the brethren when a mighty Puppets are used throughout the Camp Hill schools to bring stories to the children, particularly Bible and fairy stories. The brethren fled in terror, but Jerome waited for the lion, who stretched out a sick paw. Friedwart Bock came to Camp Hill in Scotland from Germany in 1949. He's one of the co-workers whom we filmed teaching in Aberdeen 22 years ago. He spoke then about Dr. Koenig's long-held conviction that every child, however handicapped, should have a full-time education a policy that's been widely adopted in the intervening years. Now, Alice, which is that? Feel it in time. Is it a stuff? Children that are placed in our classes who do not appear to take any active part in the lessons become a part of the class in a very amazing way. And through the common experience of a class, something of the subject can be available to them. The curriculum adopted by the Camp Hill schools is similar to that used in Rudolf Steiner schools for normal children and is based on the notion that all children, whether normal or handicapped, retrace in their development the whole history of mankind. They too, in a sense, progress from Stone Age man to Roman soldier to 15th century explorer and so on. At each age, therefore, children are seen to have a natural affinity with a certain epoch of history. This is why they educate children in classes with their own age group, irrespective of ability or handicap. And when it comes here, James, now look what it does. It gets fatter. No, it makes a left branch and it makes a oh. right branch. Oh. That, that's the breath of um, skeleton you were in. No, it's not the skeleton, it's the lungs. What do they remind you of? What does it look like? Wings? Yes, Sabrina, you got it. They look like wings. So you see, each one of you Have has a, a pair of wings in their body, in their chest. Isn't that wonderful? I'm glad too. Right. Right, now we could fly like birds. We can fly like birds. And I tell you a secret about birds. When you have the birds <coughs> flying like this, a big bird, not a small fluttering one like a robin or a wren, but a really eagle. big bird like an eagle. Or a hawk. Or a hawk, some Or a buzzard. Like a buzzard. Buzzards, yes. Okay, a buzzard. Herons mm -hmm. and storks. 
These really big birds, do you know how they fly? Like this. They breathe themselves through the air. They breathe in and out. We call it in. And in and out. In and in and out. 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 And the story of Rama and the legendary tales of ancient India are the subject of this history lesson in Claire Lise's class of 11-year-olds at saint pre a Camp Hill school in Switzerland. Everything is granted to us, and we just think it's normal to walk, it's normal to, to be able to eat and to, to speak. And, and when you have children who must really fight for that, you can only be full of, of compassion, but also of devotion. And very often, if I think of children, if I see them really, how they have to battle for every, every daily little thing, Sometimes I feel like I, I would kneel in front of them, really in respect and devotion and wonder, really. Ali, encore. Fort, encore. Ali, fort, fort, fort. Encore. Voilà, bravo. Michaelmas pageant in Aberdeen. The Camp Hill ethic is a Christian one, and celebration of the Christian festivals is at the heart of the yearly rhythm. And it's this rhythm to the year, the week, the day, that provides, so they feel, a supportive and healing influence for the children and adults alike. forward. Now you say hello to him again. How do you say hello? That's it. Yeah, go give him a nice stroke. Huh? Yes, that's it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Stuart came to Camp Hill three years ago, his hyperactivity causing both speech and movement difficulties, as well as behavioural problems. Learning to balance on a horse has already helped him to walk better. That's it. Now, where do the hands go, Stuart? Where do the hands go? What do the eyes do? Look forward. What does the mouth do? Right. Okay. Are you ready? Okay. Yes. Fine. Walk on. Walk on. Where are the eyes, Stuart? That's it. You say, walk on, Naples. Stuart, tell him to walk on. For children with speech difficulties, like Stuart, Horse riding therapy can not only develop self-confidence, it can also encourage them, through the rhythm of the horse, to breathe more regularly, eventually helping, perhaps, to unlock the words. When Stuart first came, um, we couldn't get anywhere because he was so totally unconcentrated. Eyes forward, Stuart. This simple exercise of holding with his hands onto the roller and keeping the eyes forward and keeping his mouth closed so that he would breathe properly, he simply couldn't achieve. And we tried a whole term. And we're virtually on the point of sort of giving up when 
I sort of said, well, we'll try one more thing. And I blindfolded him. Now, at first, this was an uncomfortable and somewhat frightening experience for Stuart. But we did get him settled down. And of course, the reaction was hands onto the roller, because the, the eyes were taken away. And from that, we have been able to increase his span of concentration bit by bit, so that now he can actually ride. Come on, boy. Hop. Walk on. Easy. Stand. Stand. Good lad. Stuart? Stand. Are you ready? One, two, three. Catch. Got it? Back to me. One, two, three. Wait. One, two, three. Catch. Very good. One, two, three. Back. Very good. Walk on. Walk on. Are you ready? Yes. Are you sure? One, two, three. Catch. Well done. One. Good. Walk on, boy. One, two, three. Catch. Good. One, two, three. Catch. Good. One. Isla is 10, and she's the size of a five-year-old. At 10 months, she was diagnosed as suffering from a rare chromosome abnormality known as Turner's syndrome. Right from the beginning, Isla was, if you like, an unhappy baby, a difficult baby, a child with problems. Her developmental milestones were rather delayed. She only sat at 10 months and walked when she was two, and her speech was also delayed. And as she was developing in these early years, these obsessions with which we're familiar increasingly developed too. Within the family, Isla has presented very significant challenges for the parents through her difficult behavior. And this has, if you like, increased over the years to the point where very recently, the parents asked that she be taken into voluntary care so that from now on she will spend holidays with foster parents. She won't, in fact, go home anymore. Certainly the impact of this change in her circumstances has been quite considerable on Isla. Socially, she's still someone who very much plays alongside other children. But I feel she has a much more, one could say, prominent place here in the house now amongst the children. This is Isla. She's a person in her own right. She's not someone just to be cuddled and carried around anymore because she was for many years just everybody's lovely little dolly and teddy there. But she is Isla in her own right. And Isla's house mother discusses her case at a regular clinic with the Camp Hill doctor, Isla's teacher, her house father and the therapists. So Isla... Come and sit down. Here's a chair for you, my dear. Right. You're going to say hello to Dr. Nick? Dr. Nick. Hello, Isla. Okay, say hello. Hello, my dear. Nice to see you. What a very nice dressing gown you've got on. Dr. Nick, she was in? Yes, but first you look in the book and then you put slippers. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> Can you tell us something about the book, Isla, that you've been doing? For many children, like Isla, there's no question of curing their handicaps. But they can often be helped in their struggles to face life and to cope with it. And as they grow up, to come to terms with their handicaps and even to accept them. And it's often in their relationships with each other that the children are helped most of all. Isla chooses to play with Caroline, a child who is as friendly and outgoing as Isla is complicated and withdrawn. There are 170 children resident at the Camp Hill School in Aberdeen and a staff ratio of almost one to one, made possible financially by communal living. Money for buildings is largely raised by donations. 
Not only do the adults not receive wages, but they actually live with the children in small family units, always with a mix of handicaps. The last 20 years have clearly demonstrated to us that our policy of integrating children with different handicaps is effective. There was, of course, a time in the very early years when, like most other people, we segregated children with different handicaps into different units and educational groups. All the blind children were in one unit, the autistic children in another, etc. But we soon learnt that actually mixing them was much more helpful for their development. For example, if one has a child with Down syndrome, open, sociable, affable, friendly, lots of contact, and you place that child in a group with an autistic child, a child who's very withdrawn, makes virtually no contact, maybe has a bit of obsessional play, the child with Down syndrome can really help to draw out contact and interaction from such a withdrawn autistic child. And equally, if you segregate autistic children, they remain mute, if you like, within their own worlds. And equally, a group of Down syndrome just become very silly, play up, and are not helpful to one another. So we really do believe that this mixing of children is an important therapeutic aspect within the community. But equally, we recognize that the children have a therapeutic effect on staff, at least in as much as one's open to the lessons they're trying to teach us. Things like patience, tolerance, acceptance, also humor. Some of them are incredibly funny. So both in terms of interacting amongst each other, but also interacting with staff, the children themselves provide a very strong therapeutic impulse. One relationship that has developed strongly in the last year is between Michelle and Andrea. Michelle, she's the one on the swing, is one of a small number of children at Camp Hill who is not mentally handicapped. But because of many years of social deprivation, she's not only intellectually backward, but has had severe behavioral problems. Andrea has a condition known as aphasia. She has never been able to recognize that words convey meaning, though she's not deaf. She hears, but she hears only sound and has therefore never been able to develop speech either. The isolation and frustration that an aphasic child often experiences can result in disturbed and even aggressive behavior. With the more maladjusted children, they often have an extremely negative self-image. They think they're bad, they think they're useless, they've been told that for years and years. And now suddenly they have the opportunity to shine. They are more capable, more able than many of the other pupils. Most of the other pupils don't threaten them. And they have the chance to really help another child, a less able child, and to get an experience of their own worth. <laughs> <laughs> Lately, Michelle has even taken on the task of bathing and settling Andrea at bedtime. Such relationships between children have long existed in the Camp Hill School. Roger and Simon were both deaf and psychotic, but Roger was also paralyzed and almost blind. 
so Simon helped him at bedtime. Julia was a spastic girl, totally paralyzed and dependent on others. Paula was autistic, withdrawn and reluctant to participate in the life around her. But she did respond to Julia and often took on the difficult task of preparing her for bed. Julia died in 1986 at the age of 37, having done for autism what no doctor or therapist could achieve. She finally called forth speech from Paula. Who are you going to sit with? Who are you going to sit with today? You. Who do you want to sit with? Look, I think you come and sit over in this corner. Yeah? Yes. John Bird was another of the co-workers whom we filmed 22 years ago. With a couple of helpers, he was teaching a class of 15-year-olds. Now maybe we can get started this morning, right? In 1969, John married. By then, he'd moved to Switzerland, to the Camp Hill community at saint Pre on the Lake of Geneva. Good. I mean, somewhere it seems like yesterday, because, I mean, I'm still a teacher, I'm still living in Camp Hill, still the same, the same life. Mm. Then new children, new destinies, but... Laurence, tu vas venir? Yeah. I've worked with children where after 10 years there's almost no outer um, sign of progress. And yet the parents or the, and particularly the, the friends of the family and so who meet the child much less often they can describe how the child has, has inwardly grown. He can't walk, he can't speak, he can't feed himself. He can do that no more than he could 10 years earlier. But they experience the person shining through. They meet the, the personality of the child shining through. One lives with doubt the whole time. It takes long, and sometimes you see a glimpse and then says, oh yes, it wasn't all for nothing. Oh yeah, there's a lot of doubt. How do you keep going just with so much doubt? Well, there's coffee, there's cigarettes. <laughs> It is something wonderful to do. That's, I mean, there's also, you know, there's also a lot of joy. I think it balances itself. Hey, one of the aspects I've always met in, in Camp Hill, these children, they bring out the best in one, but they also make, make it very clear to you what the worst side of you are. You have to face up to the to the darker and the more and the, ins the, the, the instinctive reactions in a situation to, to the whole instinctive side of oneself and to the and to the worst in oneself because they can just as well bring out the worst in you. And it's in and it's in these conditions of of extreme light and darkness, you know, the the grace of the of the smile of, of Barbara, uh, but also the confrontation with oneself. When, when Barbara's gaze meets you. Um, the, the extreme light conditions, but also the, the darkness one has to learn to meet in oneself and in each other. Because when we meet each other in, in how we are with the children and how we handle the children, we also meet the darkness in each other. And we have to help each other in this also. It's not just me and the child, it's me and the other with the child also. 
it's really the meeting of all these different destinies and trying to, to help. One can observe in the world around us that the living together of human beings is something very difficult and becoming increasingly difficult in our time. What we have experienced in Camp Hill is how, uh, through the living together with the handicapped children and adults, uh, an incredible uh, social strength, somehow something that brings people together. You see, in our world, we tend to, to give uh, value to people, to judge people on the point of view of efficiency, productivity, um, social status, and things like that. When you live together with a handicapped person, you have to forget that. How much can he produce? How efficient is he? And you have to try to meet the human being. We have experienced in the Campbell communities how when only the co-workers are together, it's quite difficult socially, because each one has his opinions and his wishes and his desires and his ideas and so, and actually what brings us together are really the handicapped people. You know, they kind of uh, link, they, you know, because they have a tremendous selflessness actually in their social life. They have also this incredible faculty of gratitude they can accept what we try to give them and accept it with gratitude. And gratitude is a quality that is so tremendously missing in our time. The Camp Hill co-workers and their families not only try to live with and not just for the children and adults in their care, but do so without a wages system. It has been functioning for many decades. And when people first hear about it, they usually feel it must be very difficult because we are so used to say this is my money and I don't have to you know to tell anyone what, what I'm doing with my money it's my bank account and it's my own private life and we usually feel very shy about our financial situation we don't like to talk about it actually when we start to live in this kind of community life we realize it's much easier than one would think it is because it's also a tremendous help. Because we do help each other with it. Because our needs are not always the same. At some point of our life, for some reason, we need much more. And then the others will help us. And at other points of our life, we need less. And we are able to help others. And actually, I have experienced both. I have lived on wages, and I've lived in a community. And I feel it's much easier to live in a community. It's certainly easier from a human point of view, not from a financial point of view, but from a human point of view. Yeah. <laughs> this way of handling money, you can relate it to the way you can experience it within a family, because what makes it easy for you to spend your money for somebody else, let's say your children, is that you experience the needs of your children as a reality. And because you love your children, it's not difficult for you to sacrifice, so to say, some of your money to buy them something. Tommy, tu viens avec? Tu viens avec moi? Et toi, Noël, c'est très joli de donner des becs, mais c'est mieux encore si on te va, monsieur. Bien. Oui, oui. On va prendre un qu'on aille au bateau. Tout à l'heure. Oui. C'est un peu haut, hein? The child with Down syndrome, like Sammy, has always had a very special welcome at Camp Hill. And such children also had a very special place in Dr. Koenig's heart. In sharp contrast to Down syndrome is autism. Obsessional behavior and withdrawal from human contact 
are typical symptoms of autism. In this case, Peter had helped his house father to put the chairs on the tables in order to sweep the floor, but he'd become stuck on the last chair. One more chair, Peter, look here. One more chair to do. Come. Put that one up and come here. That's it. And where will you put this one, Peter? Well, <coughs> I think we should see him. Peter is now 35 years old and living in a mental hospital in Cheshire where his mother visits him every week. She tried to get Peter into one of Camp Hill's adult communities when he was in his early 20s, but at the time he was felt to be too handicapped to cope with the largely unsupervised way of life. Peter has always loved drawing. Like many autistic and psychotic people, he has great ability in very specific areas. In Peter's case, it's art. I've not counted them. How many would you say? 50. Well, I think there's well over 50, yes. Peter knew all his colours before the age of three. The pictures are meticulously and almost obsessionally executed. He usually works on them not in the hospital, but during the few days that he spends at home each month. His designs are freehand, and each colour is itself mixed from several crayons. Each picture takes about a week to complete. Mm. Make the mouth water. Pardon? Yes, it is. Make the mouth water, that one. Yes. That's lovely. Mm. 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 Peter, the broom comes. The broom is coming. Are you ready for it? We need Peter sweeping. Come take the broom. And you, you start sweeping. Come along. Here you are, Peter. All right, well, I'll start off and then you come when you, work, when you are ready. Come along, Peter. You've taken a long time this morning. Look, just to start, uh -huh. just for mum. All right. All right. Would you do that for mum? Uh -huh. That's a special favour. You, you don't have to do more than two or three colours. All right. 
Which way do you have the map, Peter? That way, isn't it? Mm. Better be careful because it's started to split at the base, hasn't it? There you are. Come on. Good luck. Well, may I get the, pa the paper out for you? You can do this one first, now. Oh, Pete. You can do this one first. And how long will, will you be with your ritual? Ten minutes. Oh, Peter, that's an awful long time to do a ritual. Well, do it ten minutes now. Why now? Well, there ought to be now, quick. Go on, then, hurry up. What's going on, Harry? Pardon? What's going on with He's doing the ritual. What does that mean? It means that he's, he's either trying to make a certain sound come up from his mouth at a certain time and at a certain speed. Is that what you're trying to do? Yeah. You'll notice in a moment, he, he, uh, rituals, as he loses one, he gets an, he finds another. He's gone through the rituals. And he won't draw until he's done his ritual, is that it then? No. No. So I'm hoping the ritual will be very quick, aren't yes. we, Peter? Peter, I am come along, you're dreaming. You're sleeping. Good morning. Good morning. Shall I put it up for you? Shall I put it up for you? Since you go and sleep. Here's the room. Come you do the sweeping, and I'll do the chair. Come along, you do that. Peter Lim. Come on, come on. Come along, you dreamy fellow. Very, very seldom I can persuade him to leave it till later, like when his meal's on the table and things like that. But not very often. He really has, it, so, it seems as though the need to do this ritual is so important to him that it rises above everything else. Are you ready? Really? Well, hurry up. Put it up on the table now. Shall we do it together? Or shall I put you up on the table? Shall I put the whole of Peter up on the table? Shall I put him up? No! <laughs> shall we? No! Oh, well, that might be an alternative, no. mightn't it? Huh? No. Well, shall I do that? No. Or shall I sweep you out of the room? Hmm? Shall I sweep you out of the room? No. I'll sweep you out of the room. I think that's what more successful. Shall I tickle you, Peter? I think I'll tickle you. Uh. Shall I? You tickle it around the neck. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Shall I tickle it around there? <laughs> Mind your paper. Mind your paper. Now then, go and pick those scissors up now for me. Come on. Come on, because there's something nice for you. All right. Oh, he loves that, don't you? Come on. Cut the serrated edge off the paper for me. Yeah, well, if you, you know, you've done enough for it. Yeah, so come on. Yeah, well, well, hurry up, or else I'll start tickling you again. All right. Very quickly. Ready? Ready? Now you've done it now. Really? That was perfect. Come along. <laughs> Let's have them all down. Leave that chair down. Take the next one down. Yes, come on. Take it down. Take the next one down. Hmm? Light all right for you. Hmm? They used to do them at the schools, the Camp Hill schools in um, Aberdeen, and he also did them through a lot of encouragement from Christoph, his house father and teacher. Christoph Rascher was Peter's teacher and later house father for ten years. He now lives in a Camp Hill village community in his native Germany. Well, I haven't seen Peter for 15 years. And I often wondered how it would be if I would meet him. I know that he is in hospital now. And I knew or know that if I would meet him, he wouldn't come rushing towards me and say, well, here, Christopher, at last you are. Here you are. But perhaps he would stand at the window and look outside and not take any notice of me. And yet one would know he knows exactly who is there but he cannot cope with the situation, so has to withdraw into looking at things. And I wondered if one then would gently 
remind him of certain situations which one has gone through together, whether this gentle smile would break out and he would say, yes, I remember how we were together and what we did together. Peter is not a person you can meet easily and you just meet and talk to and that's it. But you have to make tremendous efforts to meet him in the first place. At that moment, the dragon came rising up from the bottom of the lake. Puppets were and still are very effective ways of reaching autistic children like Peter. Then George. Human contact was not direct, but via the puppets, and therefore acceptable to him. Swung his sword, and struck the dragon to the ground. And tell me, I hear you have been at the puppet show the other day. Yes. What did you see there? What was in the puppet show, Peter? St. George. St. George? Mm -hmm. oh, the dragon. And the dragon? Ah, what color was the dragon? Green. Green? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now that's the type of picture he has drawn so persistently. Very striking, very beautiful. But of course we are not really meant to fall in love with the pathology of the psychotic child. And yet one can hardly avoid seeing in it something of what God otherwise puts on butterflies' wings. He used to say, Christoph, how many greens are there in the world? Are there greens in heaven? Has heaven also colors? And uh, many of the questions he used to ask were not understandable if you did not try to slip into his frame of mind. You also say she was there. Yeah, she had to run, yeah. She was there. I've never met a person who has such an acute sense of color that you could show him a certain green, a leaf, and say, now try to mix that tomorrow out of memory, and he could mix it. And he lived so much, or lives so much in his sense perceptions that he has to guard himself from the onrush of the world and has to withdraw into the oddities of his behavior. And it's again one of these questions you carry as a curative teacher. How is that if you help people out of this cage of autism and Afterwards, you cannot follow it up and try to find a place for him in the world. But perhaps he had to go back into this cage, or you can even call it a cell, like a monk, and say, well, that's my world, and please don't come too near and don't break it up. That's how I can live. And if there's too much interference, I can't stand it. Peter was a person who was self-destructive. He would stand at the top of the stairs, scream, and just throw himself down the stairs, regardless of what's happening to him when he lands at the bottom of the stairs. And so you had to be careful with him that he didn't get into these moods. But then when we made these hiking expeditions in the Cam Gardens, it was an incredible experience for me to see that he actually somewhere loves life, although it is unbearable. He still loves life, because we came into a situation at the top, and I even had a rope around him, and the wind was blowing very strongly, and he was hiding behind a rock at, on the, what's it called? Well, on the summit, practically. And he started praying and said, please, God, let me go on living. I don't want to be blown down from this mountain. I want to carry on in life, and so on. And even 
like a kind of confession that he felt guilty about destroying, trying to destroy his life beforehand. And you could really meet the person who is encrusted with all these oddities of behavior, and suddenly you met the person face to face. Sometimes I don't think I'm the best person to help Peter, because I think I'm too close to him. But I do understand him, and I do love him, and I do want the best for him. Oh, no. I'd like him somewhere where I know he would be cared for. I shan't always be here. Yeah, he's always be here. <laughs> I know he'd like me to always be here, but I can't always be here. Why? Yeah. Because we, we don't go on infinitum, love. We have our lifespan and that's it. And as that's it. We yeah. don't know when and we don't know where and yeah, we don't know how. I know you'd like me to always be here. I would like to always be here with you. But it doesn't always work out that way, does it? Don't die. I hope not. Don't let's get morbid. Don't die. I hope not. Are you going to do the trap for me? Concern about their children's long-term future, as expressed by Peter's mother, is what led to the creation in the 50s of the first Camp Hill village communities for adults with special needs. The Leonhof in Germany, where Peter's old teacher Christoph Rascher now lives, was founded in 1965. Peter had an unsuccessful trial visit to a similar Camp Hill community in Yorkshire some years ago. There are now over 50 such Camp Hill villages throughout the world, and recently several have been started to cater for more severely handicapped people like Peter, who need supervision and who are not necessarily able to undertake regular work or participate in the life of the community, for instance, to act in a play. Hello! Hello! Die Leute hört! Mein Freund! Wo seht mein Freund? Christoph Rascher is rehearsing a play written by Camp Hill's founder, Dr. Koenig, about a group of handicapped people who are to be rounded up by Roman soldiers for exile to a desert island. Oh, help! Oh, help! At the start of the play, each character, the epileptic, the leper, the blind man, is absorbed in his own tragedy, seeing his handicap as a cruel blow of fate. As the story unfolds, they gradually come to accept not only their handicaps, but also each other. It's a theme that goes right to the heart of Camp Hill. When the leper appears, he's amazed that someone is allowing him to come near without running away. But that someone is the blind man, who then, in his innocence, touches the leper. Yeah. Come. Oh, When the blind person realizes he is actually touching a leper, he is absolutely disgusted and abhorred. But uh, I think he's moved by the nearness of the other person, that suddenly he realizes he is a, a human being like I am. I've never been so near to a leper. And once he is, he cannot run away anymore because he has met the other one. And so you see this tremendous fight going on in himself. He wants to run, run away. On the other hand, he wants to turn to the other person. And I think that's one of the first moments where uh, acceptance comes about. Sie sind noch Fleisch von deinem Fleisch und Blut von deinem Blut. The play is supposed to take place on the Good Friday, on the Good Friday, and now the dark hour is experienced where Christ is nailed to the cross. And in a way they are already prepared for this because they have come to a part acceptance of each other. They want to help each other. They go through this death experience and come out different people, wake up different people. Seh die Erde wieder. Bin ich nicht tot? 
nicht Bürger schon der Unterwelt. Hier sind sie alle, wie ihr wolltet. When the soldiers come in, who want to force them to this desert island, they have come to an acceptance of their fate, and probably this desert island will not be a desert island if this brotherhood which has come about between them persists. For me, the play does not only apply to people with handicaps, but to anybody. That we again and again meet the situation in life, that something happens to you which you think comes from the external. It has nothing to do with me, and you revolt against it. But then, when you slowly come to an acceptance that destiny belongs to me, that's what people used to call serenity, I think. And that's what these handicapped people show in a very strong way, that they have come to this acceptance in the end of the play. We have accepted that actually any person is handicapped in a way, that they have shortcomings, they are not perfect human beings. And I think that's important for us that handicaps are not seen as things which other people have, but that we realize each of these handicaps which other people have in a very pronounced way, we can find in ourselves. Mm -hmm. 